Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, the Society, for having me. And I'm glad to see you all this morning for topics which sort of seem like this is us, ultrasound, and what more could we possibly say? But it is my pleasure today to speak to you about the gallbladder. And this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about, uh, a bit on whether this is or is not cholecystitis, and then some pitfalls. You know, we think the gallbladder is easy or whatever, but it isn't always so, and I will share some of that. Then we'll talk a little bit about other organs in the area that can cause a problem, a little about the right kidney, and then some interesting miscellaneous topics of, that you might come across in the right upper quadrant, causing pain totally unrelated to the gallbladder. Not a lot exists new in the literature, certainly in our literature, I should say, about the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. And if you look at the appropriateness criteria from the ACR, certainly ultrasound is the top imaging modality uh, for this diagnosis. But in, in fairly large analyses, if you look, ultrasound for acute cholecystitis does not come in at 100%. It certainly doesn't come in at 90%. It's actually a little bit lower. Um, nuclear scanning clearly is higher, but gives you limited other information. And so that's what puts ultrasound, certainly in terms of no ionizing radiation and ease of uh, ability to order the study, uh, high on the list. But remember that number, and let's see if we can improve our diagnosis uh, and make that higher in our own practices. So acute cholecystitis has a whole lot of findings, and the more findings you have, the more confident you will be about the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis, because gallstones alone certainly do not make that diagnosis. A very nice paper was published from the people at the Beth Israel some years ago. I suspect it grew out of a quality assurance project, but it was very, very telling uh, about some of the problems that we encounter in this diagnosis. And they were looking at both ultrasound and CT. But as far as ultrasound went, when they looked at their misdiagnoses of acute cholecystitis, there were both overcalls and undercalls. Um, and the overcalls often had to do with other causes of gallbladder wall thickening. The undercalls had to do with very subtle findings. Uh, they, again, these were some of their conclusions, and I point out this one here, the, the Murphy sign. That's sort of like the ballywick of life in my emergency room, people calling me, is there a Murphy sign, is there a Murphy sign? And sometimes with all of the medications that are given to patients, it's very difficult to tell. It's very dependent on who does it. I'm not sure I trust anybody else except myself and some of my colleagues to do it, and I'm sure my residents get annoyed at me when I say, walk over to the emergency room and figure it out and come back and tell me. Um, so you can have subtle or moderate findings of acute cholecystitis. Here's a case in which the gallbladder has that fat tensile shape. There are very tiny little calculi with, a, with shadowing all clumped together. And the wall thickening here is very subtle, but best, best appreciated at high frequency imaging. And that's something that I would ask you to perhaps add in to your imaging if you do not do that, especially when you're considering the diagnosis and there are subtle findings. Also make sure you look all at the whole gallbladder wall because there may be areas that are thicker and other areas in which you cannot appreciate it and someone measures where it's normal and you shouldn't necessarily assume. Of course, you can have a much more uncomfortable looking gallbladder that, than this patient who's much sicker and has much more wall thickening, and this one wouldn't be a problem for most people. The next thing to think about are the complications of cholecystitis, things that go beyond just simple obstructed gallbladder, and that's when there is vascular compromise and can lead to gangrene and um, gas in the gallbladder or in the gallbladder wall. Uh, Sometimes it could be so severe, this is a CT in which the gas in the lumen and the wall completely obscures the gallbladder. This was a patient who came into an outpatient, one of our outpatient clinics. She had been having some gallbladder, some right upper quadrant pain, was an older woman, happened to be a diabetic, and the person who did the impression said cholelithiasis, and she was sent home. 
But if you look a little bit more closely, in addition to the, the gallstones, there is some sludge in the gallbladder, which is not a common thing in outpatients. So I, I tell you, when people come into the emergency room who are otherwise healthy or come to outpatient centers, sludge is a very important finding to note. There are these thick pieces of something s stretching across the gallbladder. And if you look really carefully at the wall, it's probably not quite intact in some places. So this was a case of missed gangrenous cholecystitis. The patient came back one week later to the emergency room and had a frankly uh, perforated gallbladder. A calculus cholecystitis comes up in conversation more in inpatients than the emergency room, but every now and then it is more common in patients who are sick overall. Uh, and this is a difficult diagnosis, a really difficult one to make. Uh, just seeing gallbladder wall thickening, there are so many systemic reasons for that that it may not be truly related to the gallbladder. Uh, and sometimes you just have to poke it. So this was a patient who had a lot of stuff in the gallbladder, a thickened wall. The CT wasn't really very helpful showing significant inflammation, but nonetheless, this was infected material and the patient had a cholecystotomy done. Another patient comes into the emergency room, sometimes has some pain intermittently, not that much at the time, but, but came in anyway, and the gallbladder looks like this in sagittal and transverse. This is not a distended gallbladder. It is not a tensile gallbladder. It is clearly abnormal. There are stones and there's wall thickening, and this is more uh, representative of chronic cholecystitis and unlikely needs an admission at that time. So uh, typically, the, the issue here is that the gallbladder is not that distended. Um, now let's turn to some pitfalls in imaging of the gallbladder. And I collect these. <laughs> um, you know, if you are honest and work day in and day out, you will come across these kinds of problems. These fall into the technical, anatomic, and the interpretive. So everybody gets their due here. Uh, some of these things are well known. Here's a patient who is scanned at 5, 2 megahertz, and there are things in the gallbladder, and there really are no shadows. You increase the frequency and take off the compound imaging, and the shadows are more apparent. How about this one? A distended gallbladder in an outpatient sludge, um, maybe some tiny little calculi. Is there any wall thickening here? Well, this was another one that we went up in frequency and were able to see the gallbladder wall thickening, which I think is not very apparent um, at the lower frequency. Is this sludge? Well, we turned on the harmonics and cleaned up the gallbladder, and I presume most of you know that that helps as well. How about color, right? You think stones, you think in the kidneys, turn on the color, look with twinkles, sometimes, it often is very helpful. Is it helpful in the gallbladder? Well, there are lots of twinkling things in the gallbladder. Uh, sometimes they're stones. Uh, more often than not, they're not stones. So here's lots of twinkling in this gallbladder, but you'll notice most of it has to do with all this sludgy stuff and not ter terribly much with the calculi. So it turns out that th though the majority of cholesterol stones probably twinkle, pigment stones generally do not, and if you put all that together, it's not all that helpful since we do very well in grayscale. What really twinkles is adenomyomatosis, and that's not, that's not going to cause anybody an obstructed gallbladder. Now let's look at some problem technical, other technical issues. Here's the image presented to us. It's a transverse view, right kidney, liver, the patient is supine, and this is labeled that's how it came out, labeled gallbladder fossa. And the tech thought, well, is this a so-called west sign, wall echo shadow, right? Wall echo shadow. So we went in and we moved the patient around, and all of a sudden we could see the gallbladder a lot better. But when we moved the patient back, we couldn't see it very well. Hmm. What's going on here? This patient had gas in the gallbladder. This is a CT, so it's supine. But with the level of gas and fluid in the gallbladder, sometimes yes, sometimes no, we saw it. So this was not a west sign. This was much more significant. This was emphysematous cholecystitis. This one was interpreted as adenomyomatosis, tiny little echogenic foci in the wall, and you know some little ring-down artifact afterwards. We turned the patient. And lo and behold, they moved. So, you know, little crystals in the Rokitansk gasha sinuses don't move, but again, gas moves. So those were little bubbles that had bumped up against the top of the gallbladder. There are a variety of normal variants that might 
cause you problems. This is not fluid near the gallbladder, it's a vessel. These are not sloughed membranes, these are just uh, folds in the gallbladder. We had this case a few months ago. Um, we cover other sites at night from afar. Uh, sometimes those images are read preliminarily by other people. And so we see them in the morning for final reads. And this one came up. So this was a 32-year-old woman came into the emergency room with a lot of pain in the right upper quadrant. These were the images presented. So I think we'd all agree it's a pretty distended gallbladder. The wall is a little bit thick and edematous, and maybe it's a little bright around here. And probably there was a little bit of low-level sludge. But there were no calculi. And the Murphy sign by the tech was reported as, I don't know, I'm not sure. So we um, uh, encouraged the sonographers, and in our protocol have a variety of cine clips that they take. So we looked at the cine clip. And here was the cine clip, and I'm looking and looking. I, I don't see any stones on that cine clip, and that was the gallbladder cine clip. You can see a little bit of fluid here. I mean, this was pretty suspicious. So what was the preliminary read that was sitting there? It said, a calculus cholecystitis. So that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, this is not a sick patient who came. Why would this patient have a calculus cholecystitis? So part of the protocol is the liver and the bile ducts, and there were other cine clips in there. So I keep going through the other cine clips, and I come across this one labeled sagittal liver. Now, if you look really carefully, right over there, you see it? There's the stone. One stone in the neck. Those, to me, are the most fearsome ultrasounds that are done by people in the evening or night who are not experienced. Because if that one thing is down in the neck and the angle is such that you can't see the neck of the gallbladder, that's it. You missed the one stone. So as I say to my residents, I'd rather see your images that show me this. The, the patients I worry about the most are the ones that look like a fat gallbladder with no stones that you missed it. So beware the one stone in that area. Um, This was an off-site, so our off-site sonographers in some offices do not have a radiologist on site. Others do. So if there's nobody there, they have to call before the patient leaves. And the call came in that the person there just couldn't find the gallbladder. The patient says they didn't have a cholecystectomy. And she says, I, I don't know. I don't see the gallbladder. Well, this was a little bit suspicious there. And again, it was the cine clip that saved us. Because if you look, you can better appreciate that there's a gallbladder in there. It's so filled with thick echogenic sludge that it's even hard to see the stones that are shadowing. But that's what it was. So sometimes the sludge can be so thick, so bright, that it just becomes the same density as the liver. And it's hard to see. OK, other problems. Here we go. This one's labeled gallbladder sag, gallbladder transverse. Is that the gallbladder? Well, it's a little odd that it didn't really change a whole lot in shape between the two images. There is fluid. There's something a little bit bright in there. So again, go back in, work at it a little bit more, and lo and behold, we found the gallbladder. Now, this is a, a gallbladder that's so filled with stones and shadowing that you don't see much bile in there. So it, it is a west sign. And that's the problem. When the gallbladder is so abnormal in appearance that it's not appreciated initially by the person imaging, they'll pick out something else. So what did they pick out here to label gallbladder? That was the, that was the duodenum. The opposite can happen also. This thing here was so weird, OK, and they, somebody put color on, and it just looked so crazy that they labeled it stomach. Said patient ate three hours ago. That was the debris in the stomach. When in reality, if you look again at the cine clip, that's the gallbladder with stones down there. There happened to be a cyst in the liver nearby. Oops, I'm losing my... Hold on. There we go. <laughs> it's taped down. Okay, we got it. So, the gallbladder that isn't the gallbladder, the duodenum that isn't, you can see the problems that go on. And then you ultimately can get to this point. This person comes into the emergency room with fever and right upper quadrant pain. Well, that's a pretty good looking thing that could be a gallbladder. It's got lots of sludgy stuff and maybe some things and, and maybe the wall is interrupted. This looks like a very, very sick, ugly gallbladder, except for the fact that the patient had had a recent cholecystectomy. So, 
this was an abscess in the gallbladder fossa. Certainly important to know, but you would look pretty silly if you said it was the gallbladder. And equally as much this one with right upper quadrant pain, there's a little fluid collection with something that's shadowing. This was what the gallbladder looked like three months earlier before it was taken out. And every now and then, a stone gets dropped in the gallbladder fossa, and a little fluid can accumulate around it. And both ultrasound and CT, it can almost simulate a gallbladder. So how about even, is that a stone? Did we get that one right? Well, you know, there are other things that I've shown you already uh, in the gallbladder in terms of adenomyomatosis. Polyps can give you a problem as well. So let's look at some of those. These are classic findings of adenomyomatosis, and I'm sure you would not miss those. How about these? This gallbladder was interpreted as having adenomyomatosis, little bright things anteriorly with little kind of ring downs after them. And everybody thought, okay, that, that was the interpretation of this study, and nobody said otherwise, until a few days later, the patient had a CT, and they happened to be in acute renal insufficiency and had gotten contrast previously, and so there was a curious, excuse me, excretion into the gallbladder, and that allowed us to see that there were actually calculi, and those calculi had gas in them, and they were floating in the gallbladder. So that was not adenomyomatosis. Okay, now you get a choice. Patient A, patient B. Two different gallbladders. This gallbladder has some bright stuff with shadowing. It looks like stones up here at the fundus. And this patient has bright things with some shadowing up at the fundus. Which of these patients is at risk for acute cholecystitis? So patient A, okay. Those are truly calculi up in the fundus and they could fall out all right, well, they could fall out and get into the neck. The other patient, if you look at the high res, all of this stuff was up in the fundus of the gallbladder with funny little shadows. And this one isn't going to cause the patient acute cholecystitis because this is focal adenomyomatosis, which often occurs in the fundus. And all those little crystally things are stuck up there. And they're not, unless the patient develops stones otherwise, they're not going to cause the patient any pain. Uh, polyps, usually we're pretty good at figuring out that they're polyps, they're not in the dependent portion and there's no shadowing, but the more polyps that you get, the more problematic it would be, look at this person, to try and figure out, well, is one single one of those a stone, you know? So I think in these cases, you just be humble, you know, you say, I think of most of those, if not all, are polyps, but I don't know. I couldn't definitely rule out that one of them was a stone. This one's a problem sometimes. So here's patient A and patient B. And I'll tell you that we saw one of these patients in an earlier slide. They both had some pain. Neither of them had any calculi. They both have a lot of echogenic material in the gallbladder. So what's the issue here? The thing that you really need to do is use color because patient A had color flow in the debris, in the, in the, debris, in the material in the gallbladder lumen. Patient B had no uh, flow anywhere in this, this material. So, and, and here's the spectral Doppler that confirms this. Don't just turn on the color and get one twink of color. You need to make sure that there is actually flow. So this patient has gallbladder carcinoma, and this patient had sludge. This was the patient with, that we poked the, the, uh, uh, on the previous slide. And this was a case we had within the last six months in our practice. This one was read out as um, uh, sludge, big tumefactive sludge balls, and the patient had, went to the OR, went to the OR for acute cholecystitis because there were also stones, and they unhappily found uh, the carcinoma. So tumefactive sludge, big sludge balls, can be a problem and, and can cause patients to have pain if there are no calculi. The big issue here is to try and distinguish it from malignancy, and if you can't, be honest that you can't, but remember that both those two things can look like each other. 
Now going to other causes of gallbladder wall thickening, which I've already uh, uh, mentioned in part, there are many, many processes, systemic processes, things in the neighborhood of the gallbladder that can cause gallbladder wall thickening. And in fact, in my experience, the thickest gallbladder walls are not the ones that typically have acute cholecystitis from a, a calculus in the neck. So beware. And those, some of those patients will have stones. Stones are very common, so you don't want to overcall acute cholecystitis in those cases. Here's an example. This patient has acute hepatitis. There are a bunch of little lymph nodes in the porta hepatis, a very dark looking liver, and this is the hugely thickened edematous gallbladder. Mind you, the, the gallbladder is actually small, and we have found in some of our patients with really severe uh, acute hepatitis and who present with fulminant uh, hepatic failure that um, the wall can be very, very thick, and there's not much bile being made because the liver is so sick, so the lumen will actually be small. Um, here's another case. This patient is in right-sided heart failure. You can see the heart and the, the distended veins in the liver and the very thick edematous gallbladder. There's nothing to do with gall, intrinsic gallbladder disease. Uh, one of the things that can help you is to remember that people with acute cholecystitis have lots of flow in their gallbladder wall unless it's become gangrenous, um, as opposed to people who have gallbladder wall thickening for other causes. Turning now towards the end about other issues in the right upper quadrant that you need to think about. So there are a variety of other GI issues that you need to actually look for and will find from time to time. Here's a patient who did have acute calculus cholecystitis. We had already established that. And when we went looking in the liver, there were no dilated ducts. The extra hepatic duct along its way was just at sort of the upper limit of normal, 0.63, but there were calculi in the duct. So remember that normal extra hepatic bile duct can certainly still have calculi, and you would absolutely want to know about that if you were able to make that diagnosis in addition to the acute cholecystitis. This is a case, as I mentioned earlier, in which sludge, tumefactive thick sludge, can cause problems. And this is clearly, you know, sort of obvious, a big tensile gallbladder filled with all kinds of debris. And there are dilated ducts in the liver, and the debris is in the duct, the same thing. This toothpastey stuff is going out and causing trouble everywhere. The next patient we looked at had a normal gallbladder and was having pain more in the epigastric region. And if there's not too much bowel gas, you might be able to get a good look at the pancreas. In this case, we have an enlarged, swollen, heterogeneous pancreas in a case of acute uh, pancreatitis. This is a not very common cause of right upper quadrant pain, but every now and then we'll come across. Here's the liver, and within the liver is a very large, well-circumscribed collection containing all kinds of debris and bright echoes, and there is a little bit of shadowing, and, none, and this patient had a, a hepatic abscess with gas. Don't forget the kidney. So, it's hard. I, I, I believe that. I think it's very hard in the emergency room to tell the difference sometimes where the pain is coming from. Is it really in the flank or is it the gallbladder? And that goes for CT as well. And no matter how good the person is, sometimes they'll you know, think it's a stone and get a stone search study and it's the gallbladder or vice versa. So take a look if you're in the neighborhood. You don't have to do an excruciatingly painful, delicate study looking for a small renal cell carcinoma. We're looking for major diagnoses. So this patient came for right upper quadrant pain. This is one we actually missed. The gallbladder was fine and uh, duly noted were calculi in the kidney and that's all that came out of it. Well, you know, if you, have gall if you have calculi in the kidney and the patient has pain, think and, and look a little bit more. And if you do look, you'll notice there's a little bit of perinephric fluid. And the stones were kind of shadowing, and that, I think, caused us to miss the fact that there was a little bit of dilatation of the collecting system as well. Um, and, and that was not appreciated and not commented on, and nobody did. And the people in the emergency room were concerned, and not surprisingly, they got a CT, and that's what the kidney looked like. So I suspect we could have figured out the whole thing by ultrasound had we worked at it a good bit. This 36-year-old woman came in with right upper quadrant pain and flank pain and fever and leukocytosis. This is a sagittal view of the right kidney, and that's a cine clip going from uh, superior to inferior. 
And I think you can very nicely see a pretty nice normal looking lower pole of the kidney with nice cortical medullary differentiation and an enlarged swollen heterogeneous upper pole of the kidney uh, um, with poor differentiation and, and appreciate that on the clip. Here again, upper pole, lower pole, and we look with color, poor, qualitatively poor color in the upper pole, much better color in the lower pole. So this is classic acute pyelonephritis. And that is not an infrequent finding uh, that we have in, in patients as an alternative cause for right upper quadrant pain. This patient came for a gallbladder study for right upper quadrant pain, had a perfectly normal gallbladder, had a funny looking cystic thing in the kidney with some echoes in it, and that one turned out to be a renal abscess. People don't think about abscess and they go off on, is this a complex cystic mass tumor, et cetera. This was a really interesting case. This patient presented most, the thing that they were complaining about the most was right upper quadrant pain. Very significant right upper quadrant pain. We did the ultrasound of the gallbladder and it was stone cold normal. And I remember um, one of the GI fellows coming and said, this is impossible. This patient has severe pain. There's gotta be something wrong. And we had, of course, looked at the kidney. We, a few images, um, but we went back again and, and did turn on color. Not, not to do a fancy Doppler exam, but lo and behold, there really wasn't any color there. So we checked the other side just to make sure, and that one had pretty good color. The kidney looked fine in terms of size. So it turned out, this is the MR, um, the patient, they didn't, um, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly why it came to doing an MR. The patient was a hypercoagulable patient, had had a big pulmonary embolism, mind you, and had infarcted the right kidney. And it was an acute infarction, so the kidney hadn't shrunken in size at all. Uh, and several, I've had this happen a few times. Uh, once a, a different patient had a dissection, a, a type B dissection, and, and the thing that brought them in was the pain of the infarcted right kidney. So you don't need to do a fancy Doppler examination, but just qualitatively make sure there actually is flow in that kidney. And the last thing I want to turn to are a few diagnoses as sort of fun for things that you might see in the right upper quadrant that you might not think about at all. This was a, a study done by a resident at night, and I'm reading it out in the morning, and he said, you know, the gallbladder was fine. The patient had pain. Um, I didn't think the bile duct was abnormal. And I looked at the images and I said, did you have a difficulty doing this study? And he said, you know, I, I didn't want to say I was a little embarrassed, but yeah, it was really hard. I had a hard time seeing the gallbladder. And we're looking at the, I mean, what strikes you as a little bit odd here? Why did, why did I even think he had trouble? Well, if you look here, there's all this sort of fuzzy shadowing where the edge of the liver is. And here was another image he had, he had a bunch of random images. This was, he was trying to find the gallbladder and, and there were all these weird ring downs, et cetera. So this is odd <laughs> and this is gas. And it's true, some patients might have a bowel loop up there in the right upper quadrant, but this to me didn't look like a bowel loop. It looked like extra luminal air. And this was his image, another image that he took. And I looked, I don't think I would have thought about it had I not seen the free air, but then I looked at the duodenum and the wall looked a little bit thick. So I said, you know, this is likely free air and I would worry, I'd worry about the duodenum anyway if I hadn't seen that. And, it, and we got the CT. They, the, the patient was still in the emergency room and this was a, a perforated uh, ulcer. Here's another case in which there's this odd air also, very linear, it's not in bowel, there's no bowel signature anywhere, and it's near the liver, and this is what the liver looked like. So is this a mass in the liver? Is this just a heterogeneous liver? Well, when you do the clip and you look, you see that there's something actually focal here, and stuff is shimmering and moving in it. So this patient had, um, there we go. This patient, we didn't see this one. This patient had a bowel perforation elsewhere and had a subcapsular liver abscess and had free air. So we may not know the whole thing, um, but, but could lead somebody in the right direction. And lastly, 
remember that, and if you read surgery texts about right upper quadrant pain, things that go on in the lower portion of the chest can often give people right upper quadrant pain and bring them in, and, and obviously vice versa. So sometimes we can be helpful there. If you have a person who has a chest radiograph and there's all this white here in the lower half of the chest, you really don't know without other imaging or other views how much of this is fluid, how much of this is lung, etc. So here are three different examples of what that could be. This patient has a pleural effusion and atelectasis. This patient, this is liver, there is no fluid. This is not a mirror image artifact. This is what consolidated lung looks like with air bronchograms. It looks just as solid as the liver. And a third patient has this collection in the pleural space, and this is an empyema. Lastly, and this will lead into other lectures in this series, you can think of the right upper quadrant and the right lower quadrant as sort of a continuous corridor of possible things that come to us with pain. And certainly, PID in the pelvis and salpingitis can present primarily with the pain in the right upper quadrant from PID. So we'll hear more, I'm sure, about this. But, but think about things that might go on in the pelvis as the cause of the pain in the right upper quadrant and actually vice versa. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I gave you something to think about. Thank you.